Hi hey guys, we're back again, trying to get this right so you can see what's going on here. Okay. Um, okay, chapter two, challenges for managers. Things are always changing in the world, and as a consequence, things are always changing in business. So there are some themes that um, we see in management that, will in, that are, are impacting how people get along and, and making things a little more difficult for managers to keep things going. Okay, let's see. I'm sorry about this. We're going to switch it around. That's better. Okay. So they fall into three categories, globalization, diversity, and ethics, all things that we, we hear about quite often in the, news, in the news. So let's talk about globalization first. Essentially, we've seen this change in how we define things. So we used to, it used to be that people refer to things as an international company. It refers to someone's um, a company that's held national, who's, the, the, the nationality of the, of the company is a strong part of the consciousness of the business itself. So if it's a French company, no matter where that French company is, you can have a feel for the, for, for the, the, the French culture. Um, to now we refer to it as globalization, that it's this dissolving of national borders and that we live in this borderless world. And then we also used to refer to them as multinational organizations. Um, as a multinational organization, it was just an organization that did business with another country to something... Um, as transnational, which the viewpoint is goes beyond the national boundaries. So again, it, it's just this idea of this borderless world that we live in. Okay, so what? Why have there been these changes? Um, <clears throat> because there's been social and political changes. Uh, that is, I think, apparent to everybody. It certainly, is big in the news these days. Um, that we're becoming one that, that, in many ways, business is, business is driving this. Business and other social and political issues are driving us to be to be a smaller, because the, the, the world is shrinking. Um, also, the opening of the Chinese market, that really that's only been in the past 20, 20, 20 years or so, that um, China has been an open trading partner for many other people. And um, also, in addition to that opening of different trade barriers, in our country, we see NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the economic, the European Economic Union. Um, I think it's just called the, the European Union. And they, they exist all over the world, um, all of these, the, the dissolving of the trade barriers. Now, a really important concept that in this whole thing that we're going to talk about quite a bit, this idea of... Um, of uh, Hofstad, we've talked about theories in the last chapter, we talked a lot about theories and understanding theories. So Hofstad is one of the many behavioral theorists, uh, behavioral scientists who have come across, come up with these different kinds of theories. And Hofstad is one of them. And he talks about five different dimensions that people look at. Um, individualism versus collectivism. Individualism versus collectivism is this idea that um, uh, a cultural orientation that people belong to a loose social individualism, that there's this loose social framework. We really are just interested in ourselves. Their primary concern is um, for their families. Whereas collectivism is this idea that there's um, individuals belong to this tightly knit social framework and that, you know, that people stick together and they're very concerned about what happens to the group. It's not just about them and their families. It's what happens to the group. The U.S. is seen as an individualistic society. Um, we're not quite as concerned about our neighbors as some other social, um, collectivist groups, collectivist countries. A lot of South Americans are collectivist countries. Um, Northern European countries are collectivist countries. So there's that one. And there's high power distance and low power distance. High power distance and the lower the the low, the power distance is about how um, how much a society accepts an equal or unequal distribution of power. In our society, we really go for ethics. We're very interested in ethics. Wait, am I sorry? What am I saying? Ethics. Scratch that. We're interested in equality. 
this idea we try to try to um, make sure that everybody is equal and that, you know, if, for example, the president of the college were to walk through the halls of ECC, he would say hello to people. He would talk to people. People wouldn't be afraid to talk to him and he wouldn't be he wouldn't think it was beneath him to talk to others. At the, you know, the CEO was willing to talk to the, the maintenance men um, or, you know, the guy who works in the mail room or whatever, that people, there, there isn't this idea that there's a, like a quote unquote caste system that exists. So that's power distance. Um, uncertainty avoidance as to how much someone, how much a country can, under, can tolerate ambiguity. Ambiguity is this idea that um, things might not be necessarily very clear. And before you undertake a project, do you know what the exact outcome is going to be? Generally speaking, um, the United States is, uh, in terms of uncertainty avoidance, um, uh, people don't want to have any kind of threat. So um, high certainty avoidance are cultures that tend to seek consensus, whereas low uncertainty avoidance, people tolerate ambiguity. They're more willing to take risks. The United States is definitely a, um, they, they don't, they're, they're very risk, they're not risk averse, so there's this, we, we have low uncertainty avoidance. Then masculinity and femininity, masculine countries, masculine cu cultures um, are, tend to be very assertive and materialistic, whereas feminine cultures tend to be interested in relationship and concern for others. The United States is also a masculine company, country. And then there's this idea of long-term orientation and short-term orientation. So time orientation is, um, we should talk about time, as time orientation. It's uh, whether a culture's values are oriented to the future, which is long-term, or toward the past and the present, which is short-term. So future or long-term orientation, um, China is ex ex a long-term orientation. They're interested in like values and Values such as thrift and persistence, they look towards the looking towards the future, um, and then uh, short-term orientation is are countries that have this idea of um, value, respect for tradition, meeting social obligations, that kind of thing. The United States is um, seen as having a short-term orientation. So these next couple slides talk about that. We can go through those. Okay, let's talk about diversity. It's important when you're talking about diversity to understand that diversity comes in many different forms. And it's not just about gender or um, race, but it could be age, uh, people's abilities, people's religion, obviously, people's personalities. Some people have very outgoing personalities. Some people have very reserved personalities. Um, people's social status also can be considered something that uh, is considered diversity and it's it's very realistic particularly in our country that people of different social statuses will be working together. Social status is measured by education level, not so much income but wealth. Also can be measured when um, people's involvement in the community, that kind of thing, and also their job, people's jobs, which sometimes people who have um, lower status jobs might make more money than people with higher status jobs. So social status plays a role. And then finally, sexual orientation. Homosexual versus heterosexual. So the thing about diversity, and there's all, you know, all sorts of different kinds of people work are, are working um, and are, are in the workplace. And it's important to understand and respect that and understand that that could, in fact, influence how people get along. Okay, so there's benefits and problems of diversity. You can read through those. Um, essentially, the you know the big benefit is that it, you bring all sorts of different viewpoints to an organization. That's a big benefit. There's usually it usually promotes a lot more creativity and innovation, better problem solving, improves marketing efforts. And that if you have different types of people in an organization, chances are you can have, you know companies have different kinds of target markets. 
that they different types of customers they go after. So if they have a more diverse organization, the people who work in the organization are going to be able to um, understand and relate to people from different backgrounds. So they could it's easier for them to um, you know market their products to them. Okay. And then there's also there's some problems that tend to, people tend to have some sort of resistance to change. No one likes change. There might not be as much cohesiveness, so that would cause for more understanding and communication because people have all sorts of different people. Different people communicate in different ways. You can go through that list of of um, you know gen, there's a lot of research about gender communication. It can cause more interpersonal con, interpersonal conflicts and also um, it can slow down decision making. Okay, so globalization. Now, the second one that we talk, we're talking about in terms of um, uh, uh, issues in the workplace are ethical, is there ethics in the workplace? So there's a couple of different types of eth ethical theories that we're concerned about. Hang on one second. Globalization, diversity, okay, ethics is the third one. So consequential, um, it's a consequence, instead of necessarily looking at the, at the um, uh, result, that, that instead of looking at the, the behavior, look at the result of the behavior. So that this idea of the ends justify the means. I assume you've probably heard that before, that concept. Um, that the, 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 anyway, so perhaps if it's, you know, if you're, you're going to um, have a huge layoff and it's going to save the company, even though people lose their jobs in the meantime, but the, the company would be preserved in the meantime and also, or, you know, the, and at the end, the, company, the people's jobs are saved. And so people in the, maybe the, in the income to the community and the taxes to the community, that kind of thing. Okay, rule-based theories say talk about the act itself rather than the effects. So how is it carried out? And then finally, character theory, that you look at the person who does it. Well, it might not have been the best thing to do, but I believe in that person and their ability to make decisions. That's the idea of character. To look at the person, not necessarily the act. The act. All right, and there are a variety of different issues in terms of ethics that people are concerned about in the workplace. Too, employee rights, privacy, and confidentiality, particularly when it comes to like medical histories and things like that. Also, um, how much you know in terms of looking at people's emails and finding out information about people you know if the people private looking at if you are using a company company um, computer to send out private email are they looking and getting your contacts in there and developing information based on that sexual harassment is a huge issue in the workplace still today um, gender harassment is making uh, making comments towards people that are perhaps not, um, that could be considered hostile. Aggressive comments about either gender um, and also um, towards homosexuals or towards heterosexuals too. Things that are crude. Unwanted sexual attention, touching people, saying things that you shouldn't say, putting pressure on people for dates and that kind of thing. And then sexual coercion is this idea that um, uh, that if in return for some sort of sexual favor, you'll get a promotion or you'll get, or if you don't apply that you'll get a demotion or some sort of harassment. Okay, organizational justice. There are two different, organizational justice is how just is the organization. So, so two things we talked about. Distributive, which is, is the fairness of the outcome. Oh, that's a typo, sorry. Fairness of the outcomes people receive in an organization. There's a second, there's a second in in there. Sorry about that. And then procedural is fairness, the process itself. So, for example, um, 
you know, if someone has is chronically late and they get fired, but maybe someone who's caught stealing from the cash register doesn't get fired. Is that necessarily fair? Or if someone is, um, you know, one person is late because of the fact that they have some sort of family problem and it's not impacting their work, but they still get they still get fired when someone who's you know late all the time, um, and maybe they're friends with someone in the organization doesn't get fired. And then procedural is is there a process to take care of things or is it done arbitrarily without any kind of rhyme or reason? Okay, moving along here. Whoops, okay, there we go. All right, so there's a couple of other issues. Whistleblowers, whistleblowers are people that tell the authorities about what's going on. Whistleblowers became um, kind of a common, common household word during the Enron scandal in 2001, because that's how people found out about it. Someone who, um, it was you know someone who went out and, and um, exposed the wrongdoing as a consequence of that, there is legislation that protects whistleblowers and um, also companies that are of a certain size need to have a confidential tip line that they can call. So that's something that it's, it's a safeguard, but you have to make sure that those whistleblowers are protected. And I finally, social responsibility is the idea that companies are not just responsible to their stockholders and their shareholders, but the companies are also responsible to their um, to the community and to their employees to make sure that they're good citizens. So they're not polluting. They're not causing um, uh, that they in some way they give back to the community. They support organizations and causes. Okay. Now then, so there's th 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 they talk about this in the book. The four way test as to whether or not um, uh, what you what you do is ethical. The first question you want to ask yourself is: Is it the truth? Is what you're saying true? And that should be pretty obvious to people. Um, is it fair? Are you in some way treating someone poorly that should doesn't deserve to be treated poorly? Will it build any kind of goodwill? Will this activity build goodwill? And will it be beneficial to everybody? So you want to think about that in terms of, you know, what, what is the long-term outcome? There's another test you can do too. Is it legal? Um, what I want people who I respect or admire to know, so for example, a parent, a mentor, or a spouse, would they, it would, it be, how would you feel if they knew what you did? Would they be ashamed of you if they found out that you were stealing from the company? Would they be ashamed of you if they found out that you found, gave a customer, sold a customer list to a competitor? And then would you want it in the news? How would you feel if what you did was in the newspaper? Would you be embarrassed about that? So there are all sorts of different ways that companies try to um, uh, outline what they consider to be ethical behavior. And there's usually an ethics policy, a code of ethics. It's the idea to uh, guide employee behavior and conduct. It's common in professions such as medicine and law, but businesses don't necessarily have them. And so each company um, usually has their own code of ethics. It's possible that uh, if you work for a large corporation, you know, even like Target or Wegmans, that you may have had to sign an ethics agreement when you started working there. So that's it for Chapter 2. Um, I'm uh, trying to keep this, I'm teaching this class seated as well. And so I'm trying to sort of, this is where we are in the seated class. And so we're going to try and kind of go on the same Pace is my seated class, but I will before the end of the week um, post chapter three. Also for chapter three, there's a it talks about personality, and there's a personality um, test that I'm going to have you take. So look out for that as well. I just have to um, I just have to get it to a format that I can post online. So here you go. I hope these were helpful. And again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, either through email or phone. I will tell you with my phone. Uh, I switched offices and everything switched, but there's been a delay in getting my phone switched. I have a phone, but it's on it's on my old desk. 
and I have someone else's phone on my desk. So I might not answer, but if I don't answer, uh, I check every day to see if I have messages. I check a couple times a day to see if I have messages so I can call you back. Or as I said, you can always find me on email. Okay, thanks guys, and um, see you next time.